Mandan Barara works as a developer at ThoughtWorks. He's worked with Java, Ruby on Rails, and uh, he's been learning a bunch of different paradigms along the way in Java. Okay, uh, and uh, with the kind of applications he's been working on, he's developed a keen interest for JavaScript and has been experimenting with a bunch of client-side frameworks, Angular, Backbone, Jasmine, Phantom. He's passionate about sharing his learnings with the community. And he's coached, oh, he's coached events at uh, Rails Girls. Why do I uh, and besides project works, he's also developed 2D JavaScript games with keyboard and mouse stuff. A prolific guy. Um, just see. His talk is actually about um, offline stuff in the browser. You know, stuff like IndexedDB, AppCache, and local storage. Uh, you get to learn what the connection? benefits and possibilities of storage in the browser. Segregation of concerns provided, Just how Angular no, no, plays no, no, with no offline, uh, HTML5 offline and browser support. Yeah. Bunch of stuff in the next 20 minutes. Why is it playing on its own? Huh? It seems to be playing on its own. Are you hooked up? No, no, that was me. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right, Manan, yes. good? Yes. All right, everybody give it up for Manan. Uh, am I audible at the back? Get back. Get oh, back. Back. okay, so, right. Yeah. Awesome. Hi, uh, my name is Manan. Today we'll be talking about the offline capabilities of the modern browser. Uh, we'll be discussing the local storage uh, app cache index DB in a little more detail and basically look at the segregation of concerns offered by these APIs. Uh, I'm going to start with some facts. These are basically the internet user contributions by these various continents. Uh, if you look, Asia basically has a 48% internet user contribution. Now, uh, without further stats, this might be easily in, uh, misinterpreted. Let's scale it with the actual population of the continent. So if you look, uh, so Asia contributes 60% of the entire world's population. Of the 60%, uh, only about 28% of the entire continent has access to internet. Uh, this situation is far worse in a continent like Africa, where the situation is around 16%. So clearly there is a need for offline. Uh, this is a very uh, common scene in a place like a village in Africa or say India. Uh, there are no wires, there is no scope for them. So clearly they don't have internet. The only way that these people from such village dispensaries or some places can connect to internet is by going to a central facility. So how can we aid that? So I present to you this particular use case, which is clearly aided by the HTML5 APIs. So our user goes to an internet-enabled facility. He's able to cache whatever data he needs to be able to work offline at a later stage. He is then allowed to basically leave the internet-enabled facility. Thanks to the HTML5 APIs, he can now work offline. He can do gets on the data. He can basically work on it. He can store data back on his local machine itself. And finally, whenever he gets back his internet, he can sync it to the server. Really straightforward. All right, the first API we'll be discussing is the local storage. It's a simple key value store. The only catch being both the key and the value are strings. Uh, the local storage quickly gained popularity because it was implemented by almost all of the major browsers. Another reason for its popularity was because it was the first standardized client-side persistence mechanism since the traditional browser cookies, that is. Uh, the API is pretty straightforward, which is why it possibly has many fans also. Uh, you're offered simple setters. Uh, the browser treats the local storage as a map, which means you can basically uh, use the map notation to set values. Uh, the getters are straightforward as well. You can, again, use the map notation to fetch values. Uh, I have a simple demo that I could use. Uh, I have a local node instance running, which I can show. Hang on. No, this doesn't work.
right anyway uh that is marlin brando uh didn't really come out as i would have expected but anyway that is not uh, relevant we basically want to pop up in the chrome console uh as soon as i can get perfect size on this thing right visible okay uh okay so in the chrome console as i said the index uh, the local storage object is available in the window itself so you can do window dot local storage dot you have setters let's say i'm going to do fridge or fridge and i'll say my fridge now if you look under the resources tab you find the local storage and uh, sorry the local storage and you clearly see that it's the key value pair uh, this i can show you quickly the getter also there you go uh, it offers a similar remove item api as well thank you uh, all right i'm going to get back to the presentation okay uh, uh, a fact about the local storage api is that it is it only offers about 5 megabytes of storage space in the browser uh, which since you can only store strings it basically means that since each character is occupying one byte you get to store 5 million characters flat not really in chrome which uses utf16 encoding and uses 2 bytes per character this situation is a little changed so you only get 2.5 million characters now this is really constraining anyway we'll talk more about this later also sorry all right the next api we'll be discussing is the application cache the application cache is a browser cache which basically allows you to cache content for offline use uh it is for your static content your html js css images whatever you want to be made available offline um one thing i would not like you to confuse it with is the regular browser cache this is not the browser cache uh the primary differences lie in the fact that the regular cache headers are ignored by the application cache this is a separate cache it is implemented apart from the browser cache uh you if you use the browser cache you would know that doing a command shift r on on an apple mac basically does a hard refresh forcing the content to be loaded from the server this is not the case with the application cache once put inside the application cache it will always be served from the application cache uh, of course unless it changes from the server or the user explicitly goes ahead and deletes it uh you basically start working with the application cache you're using the manifest attribute inside your html tag uh, then you give it a path of a file which we call the manifest file uh, this is the basic format of a cache manifest it begins with the words cache manifest the second line here is basically a comment you need comments because that is the only way to notify the browser that okay something's changed and you need to refresh the cache the cache has three sections the first one that we'll be talking about is cache this is the explicit section whenever the page is visited these uh, resources will be cached for offline use the fallback section is a little more interesting the uh, it each entry has two values the first one is a resource which in case the user is offline will be replaced by what is mentioned in the second value uh, it means that if the user is offline instead of serving him the image of einstein tongue you will be serving offline.jpg uh the last section is the network section you basically specify what is explicitly to be fetched from the server no matter what star is a while call you say that if it is not found in the app cache fetch it from the server uh yes i have a demo for this as well so let's get back the ugly sized chrome all right uh, this is a demo app that i basically prepared uh, for showcasing angular js back in my office uh, it's a simple app you can click on this it then gives you this image uh, then you can click on this image and it makes the text editable one mouse out it basically brings it back uh, so anyway i let's let's make this app available offline so i have the code sorry yeah 
Yeah, it wasn't working. I tried. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, is the text too big, or is it okay? this a little better okay so uh, i uh, so as you can see i've added this manifest attribute so which means that it has already cached whatever content i needed uh, you can access this cache by going to chrome slash slash app cache internals app cache internals which basically shows you that for this domain you have some entries already cached you can view these entries it basically tells you these are the entries that it has already cached which means we should now be able to run our app completely offline all right let's try that uh, as soon as i can figure out all right okay i'm going to stop my server so i did that so i'm on this page i'll do a hard refresh so it still runs and just to showcase what we've achieved when i click on this now instead of presenting me with the einstein tongue image it is now giving me the fallback image uh, if you look in the network section right now uh, if i do a refresh on this page you see that what i'm ask actually asking for what the call goes for is the einstein tongue and albert einstein the, the different images but because of the application cache the response that it gets is actually the offline image so with this you can actually have a completely offline running application which which works fabulously even without the network the einstein image i did not download i said instead of the einstein image serve it with this different image when you're offline uh, if i bring back the server now if i run the app it gives me the einstein image again so this is uh, it's sort of a little smartness that is built into the application cache itself all right moving on uh, there's some facts uh, it needs to be served with the manifest file needs to be served with the text slash cache manifest uh, mime type uh, the preferred extension being dot app cache uh, some of the gotchas is that even if one of the resource that is being downloaded for the app cache is not downloaded say you get a 404 or something the entire cache is disregarded so you need to look out for those things uh because of such things the app cache has been has received many critics it has been called as a douchebag by people uh i guess at the end of the day it basically boils down to the fact i mean how smart do you want your apis to be they could be uh, really dumb and offer you all the flexibility in the world or they can be smart and constrain you every way possible uh the next api that we'll be discussing is the index db this is basically a database implemented inside the browser itself it is a, a simple no sql json store uh the benefit offered by index db is that it allows you to create indexes on your data to fetch them later uh with better performance say you were doing the same thing with local storage you would basically fetch the entire set and then do a find in memory all right so i've been shown so as i said uh, there are several benefits offered over the local storage than this it gives you a better store in place of just storing strings you're storing json data uh it also understands queries which means that you can say okay fetch me a particular object in which the name matches the string abc star so the api is actually pretty smart uh the browser support it is now supported by most of the major browsers even I internet explorer 10 supports it uh firefox has been supporting it ever since 4 or 5 i think chrome supports it safari has not yet moved away from the web sql model uh So the index db object is also found in the window. Uh you basically initiate your work with the index db by the open request. The first param being the name of the database, second one being the version that you're opening the database for. Uh it basically returns to you a request object. Now this request object is the object on which several functions might be called since the entire uh, API is asynchronous. Uh the first method is the on upgrade needed method. This is basically where you define your migrations. you have the handle for the database you can define new object stores 
object stores are similar to your collections in MongoDB or tables in SQL. Uh, you can you can put constraints on the schema. Uh, you can set it up with some reference data that you want to work with. Uh, okay, the next uh, function is the on success. This function is called when you have the final handle of the database. In case the upgrade needed method is fired, this function is called after the upgrade needed method. You again have the uh, access to the database, only you can't make schema modifications. You can put data, you can get data using transactions. Uh, as I've shown, uh, I'm opening a transaction to an object store called food, and the transaction is specified to be read write. So, quick demo of this thing. All right, uh, so this is uh, an application I've just created to showcase. Uh, all right, so if we check the console, it says the uh, fridge connection successful, which means the on success method has fired. I've just added simple console logging to whatever code I was just showcasing. So the fridge connection is successful. I can do a simple, let's say, I say put the eggs. Uh, that was not supposed to happen. I'm going to clear the database real quick. All right. And clear. Fresh. All right. So uh, since I deleted the database, the on upgrade needed event fired, which means the version upgraded console log appears. Then it says connection is now successful. You can also see under the resources tab that I now have a fridge database with the sample data that I had set up. I can now do the put the eggs in yes, yes, it does work, okay. So it's successful. I can look under the resources tab and hopefully now when I refresh, it gives me two objects. Uh, the second one being the eggs. So the eggs have been successfully put into the fridge. Uh, I also have a simple get. Uh, this was again uh, shown in the code. I, when I do get, you can see this was fetched from the database. You have to take my word for it. Uh, getting back to the demo. Yes. All right. Uh, so uh, say you don't have a use case for offline. What what do these APIs basically offer you? I was looking for examples. I came up with a few that I'd like to mention. Just two or three. Uh, okay. So the first one is okay. So you present the user with a huge form. He's filling it up. In the middle, he basically loses his internet connection. Now he does a submit, and there is no way you can actually store data. But what if, when he was filling the form, on every blur event, you were basically saving it to the local database? There's nothing you're losing. It's on his machine itself. And when he comes back to the page after he gets back his internet, if he comes back, and you can just give him an option saying, OK, you were working on something. Would you like to continue? Simple as that, wouldn't that be cool? Uh, your, your applications obviously run faster because not, no request is going to the server thanks to the application cache. Most of the things are fetched from your machine itself. Uh, this again, since no requests are going to the server, the server load decreases, which means your server can pay attention to more important things. Yeah. Uh, so, as uh, you can see, it made six requests and no bytes were transferred. Most of it was just coming from your cache. Uh, we built this basic, I've been working on a project which uses these APIs heavily. So uh, it's called OpenLMIS. It's on GitHub. If you want to check it out, it uses these APIs as well. Uh, that's, that's my Twitter handle. It's my GitHub. And that's about it. Do I have time for any questions? You have time for two questions. Let's uh, a couple of questions. Any okay. questions? Okay, all the way back there. Hey, <clears throat> when you are in the offline mode, uh, when a network request is made, what is the response, uh, you know, code? Like, you know, is it still 200 or, you know, it shows something else? It's 200, but it says fetch from the cache. Uh, I, I think I, uh, in the uh, inspector you can see the response is 200. Right. Is, is there a way to figure out that, uh, you know, uh, from where that, uh, you know, response came from? When, by came inspecting from the network tab. Oh, uh, you're saying, uh, in your code, is there a way to figure out if it came from the cache or the server, or uh, not exactly code, but in a famine lighting from the inspector? Yes. Can I see that out? Yes, there? yes, yes. Uh, for any request, the inspector basically tells you if it was served from the cache. Okay. It even tells you if the server responded with a three or four, and then it was served from the cache. So okay. yes, you, you can easily figure that out. 
Okay. Uh, actually, I have a couple of questions, if it's okay. Uh, so the first one I saw that uh, slide you had, where a list apart calls uh, the app cache a douchebag, and uh, I was just curious as to why exactly is it because you have no way to clear the app cache? Uh, you do have a way to clear the app cache. So then, why does he? Uh, so. Uh, there are a few things which are very annoying about the app cache. The first one uh, is that, okay, say you fetched like 15 resources, you have it running offline. Now say the content on your server changes. One of those files have changed. There is no way that you can refresh that one file. The entire application cache will have to be refreshed, which means 15 calls will go to the server. Now there are ways to handle that. There are optimizations. You can use the secondary browser cache. Uh, which will then say, okay, the rest of the files have not changed, don't fetch those, but hey, this file has changed, fetch that. But yeah, the application cache in itself doesn't offer that smartness. That's one one of the things. There are others like, uh, well, one of the things is uh, a page that is that uses the manifest file will use all the resources fetched from the cache. No matter what, if, if there's something, if there's a section called network that I showed, if you don't specify that, then it is expecting everything to be coming from the cache. If it doesn't find anything, it will break. So it's a really silly thing. I mean, so it, it is solved by adding a star to your network section. <laughs> it's something they could have provided by default also. Okay, so the second question basically was, uh, my, uh, it's just curiosity. Uh, you said that uh, app cache and local storage and the index DB, I think, uh, are supported across all major browsers. Is there a standard, I mean, uh, is it all through the same type of API uh, do I have to make changes to the way I call things? No difference at all. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just that uh, there are some things, but they're very specific. Like uh, Internet Explorer's uh, index DB does not have composite indexes. You can you can live without composite indexes. You can create your own composite index on the fly. So yeah, you, there are workarounds, but majorly the specification is constant across all of the browsers. All right, awesome guys! Round of applause for Manan.